This is Anand Shimpi from Anantech.com. This is our first podcast, and we have two of our senior editors here. We have Ian Cutris, who is our senior motherboard editor, um, and we have Brian Klug, our senior smartphone editor. So guys, uh, why don't we start with you, Ian? Do you want to just give a quick introduction and, and tell us a little bit about what you're working on right now? Um, hi, everybody. Yeah, my name's Ian. Um, you'll recognize me as the guy with the British accent. Um, in the motherboard space, um, everything is Ivory Bridge currently. Everybody wants to talk about Z77. I call it Z77. You say Z77. Um, so ideally, we've got a range of K processors to go with the motherboards if you like to overclock. Um, motherboards like the overclocking. We've uh, currently all the motherboards that I've tested easily hit 4.4 gigahertz if you want performance. Um, lots of cheap memory to go with this. Um, lots of graphics cards to choose. Um, there's a lot of boards currently available on the market which hit a lot of a very interesting price points. A lot of bang for the buck. For example, recently I reviewed the Gigabyte GAZ77X UD5H, which for $180 on Newegg um, hits a lot of very important features. Um, we've got MSATA, we've got dual network, there's loads of stuff. It's all in the review. Um, go check it out. Um, that's a board that I'd recommend. Uh, so uh, re real quick then, Ian, uh, let, let me, let's introduce Brian as well. And I'll, oh. Brian, I'll ask about what your current system configuration is. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Brian, what are you running right now? What's your, your main system? Uh, my desktop is still a Z68 and it's, um, it's got a i7 970 that you sent over and, okay. uh, two GTX, uh, 690s. I mean, 680s. What am I saying? And, um, of course, an SSD. I believe it's the uh, it's that Intel one because we were getting some oh Cherryville. Issues. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah, right. And it's Intel's... still holding up. That's good. That's good. And hold on, you said Z sixty eight or X fifty eight? Oh, I meant X fifty eight. That's okay. right. Yeah, I have another Z sixty eight, and sometimes I get them confused. I gotcha. And but, then, yeah. so Ian, for someone like in in Brian's position, you know, is that still? where you'd recommend they be? Like if someone is still on kind of Gulf Town or, or X58, uh, when when is when should they be considering upgrading? Um, well, with the landscape as it is, um, Brian's obviously a power user. Um, he, loves his <laughs> he loves his performance. I and need more cores. And, and with more cores, <laughs> yeah. So um, we, 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 with moving to the newer platforms, obviously he's going to get some IPC increase in performance um, if he's willing to shout out the price. It obviously depends on what his uh, refresh schedule is. Yeah, um, but but Brian, so here's the thing, right? In, in North America, at least, uh, the desktop PC refresh cycle is now, you know, for mainstream consumers, it's beyond five or six years now. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm even seeing, like, some of our readers, right? They're coming back and saying, you know, I still, I'm running Core 2, I'm running, you know, first-gen Nehalem, and I have no reason to upgrade. In, in your eyes, you know, if we assume Brian's a kind of unique case where, I mean, he'd upgrade every eight months, I'm sure, <laughs> you know, if, if, if given the right hardware. What, um, you know, what are you seeing amongst, you know, the, the kind of less extreme enthusiasts? Um, I see still a lot of people running P55. Yeah, that's true. Linfield was yes. a good part. So a, a lot of people went straight into Sandy Bridge when that came along because that provided such a big increase. Um, the Ivory Bridge route obviously isn't such a big increase as we've seen from the benchmark, so people are still quite happy with the Sandy Bridge. If you're still on Linfield and you feel like you've got an ETO upgrade, then Ivory Bridge is a perfect, perfect stepping point. If you're still on <laughs> Gulf Town and Bloomfield, then Sandy Bridge is, is your calling point should you have the money and you want to upgrade. You, so you would really recommend Sandy Bridge E? Like for me, I, I'm, I'm totally done with the kind of ultra high-end Intel platforms. If, um, if, if you need performance, I mean, uh, obviously Brian being the power user he is, and he, as he says, he wants more cores. Sandy Bridge see, E would be the way to go. That's the thing going. too, is that I, I feel like if I go to four cores, you know, like I have a 2500K, but at the same time I have Gulf Town, right? So... Which yes. am I going to sit at more? It's Gulf Town, right? You yeah, know, like... that's true. I I just feel like that. You know, it, it's. I don't feel like we are going to see tons of cores in this kind of mainstream, you know, high end mainstream platform anymore from Intel. Um, so so so, how, how do you think they're going to 
improve the user space because obviously every time they bring out a new chip it's got to have more performance if they're not going to bring that about by more cores they're not just going to keep bumping up the clock speed are they no well so i think with haswell we start experimenting with um embedded dram uh then, then you get some really interesting you know performance improvements where you can start talking about uh localized memory with you know let's say up to 100 gigs a second of memory bandwidth and I don't know that that's going to be in the first instantiation of Haswell, but uh, you know, in the mobile side for Haswell, we use we'll use that that stacked or embedded DRAM to to kind of drive graphics performance. Um, so you're but, suggesting an L4? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. An L4 yeah, and and I think in the in the server space that becomes really interesting, right? Um, you know, if you if you start co collecting multiple Haswell packages with uh, kind of you know embedded DRAM. You get tons of memory bandwidth that's you know extremely useful, um, and I have to believe that that's a stepping stone for for kind of the, you know the the power user on the on the desktop side. Well, um, you have to consider that if if you are the extreme power user that does a lot of video encoding, your main limitation is moving data from your storage into the memory, then memory into the CPU. So I'm not sure if the embedded DRAM will be much of an, Im an improvement there. Well, I, video transcoding is always like a compute bound thing, right? Like this is more of a, you know, how does, how does the, the, the breadth of the market, how do they see a performance improvement? Um, and, so, and that kind so, of step so, function of bandwidth increase, I, I think that always is, is good for something. It's, it, it, well, for, for the standard user, um, for the normal home user, for my father, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> moving up from the mechanical to the solid state drive really did increase his performance increased his work throughput yes and that, that's that... actually that's something i've been struggling with a lot lately right we're getting a lot of um, notebooks and ultrabooks in at these like let's say thousand dollar price points and they all use mechanical hard drives and i don't know that there is going to be room for a mainstream computer that doesn't have solid state storage as the boot and os drive or the os and application drive anymore that's um, just a function of bomb though right I know you it know, is. I think I think the OEMs recognize the importance, but ultimately, getting to that bomb, they just want, you know, hard drives are cheap. But so I, I see it as an issue, though, right? Like if you look at uh, buying, let's say, a four hundred dollar desktop versus a five hundred dollar tablet, the five hundred dollar tablet delivers uh, consistent I/O performance, right? Whereas the four hundred dollar desktop. You know, it might have a faster CPU. You can you can run newer games on it and stuff like that, but you still get that painful kind of chunking. Um, and especially once you start talking about thousand dollar machines, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm jaded. I, I feel like the room for for hard drive based or or at least a system where the hard drive is the primary OS and application drive. I believe the 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 room for that in in the mainstream space is going away significantly. I think that uh, changes with Windows eight a lot. I don't know what the chassis spec is, but you know, if you look at all the Windows RT tablets, are there really any that have hard drives, right? Like, I think that expectation is, is there. Well, don't, don't forget the difference between the desktop and the tablet. For a tablet, you're uh, consuming, you know, media, so you want everything to be instant. When you swipe the page of your newspaper, you want it to be instant. If you're a desktop user, if you're, particularly if you're gaming, as, as you suggested, you know, you may not mind a two, uh, you know, a two-minute load time to play your game if you know, you only need to do it once. Oh, no, so I, I agree that a like, point. For, for a desktop user, um, especially for a gamer, right, you need that, that beefy one, two, three terabyte hard drive. But I, I don't know that from like a, a usability perspective that I can accept a machine that, that, you know, a brand new machine that doesn't have solid state storage, at least for the OS and things like your web browser and, and you know, your basic applications. Just because the impact there is so tremendous, and it's so frustrating, right? Using, especially in these, if we're talking these low price points, right? They're not fast hard drives. Yeah, they're like 5,400 RPM. Yeah, and especially, you know, if, if form factors do continue to go in this kind of, you know, everything gets smaller direction, uh, I wouldn't be too surprised to see two and a half inch drives used in a lot of, you know, whatever the new desktop ends up being. Um, and I don't think SSD caching fixes it, right? Like I, I'm, I've been playing around with this um, ASUS UX32 VD. It's you know it's got 32 gigs or whatever, um, or maybe 24 gigs of uh, NAND flash to act as an SSD cache. 
and it's better than a traditional, you know, just a two and a half inch hard drive, but it's frustrating to use, right? If you have an SSD or solid state device anywhere in your life, uh, I don't know. I, I feel like that does more to hurt the end user's perception of your brand and, and the device they're using than anything else. Well, obviously, um, it makes them look somewhat cheap, right? Yeah. You know? <laughs> with, with, with that configuration, um, you remember the Seagate Momentus XT? Yes. The combined hey, one. I does still it, run does one. it? Does it I feel still like have that, one right now? <laughs> you know, because that, 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 that's the midpoint, isn't it, between your classic hard drive and solid state? But so my issue with any of with the Momentus um, XT and and with any of the the SSD caching you know based solutions, the cache is never big enough, especially on the Seagate side, right? Like it's it's you need I think a minimum of sixty four gigs, and and that has to be a very well managed cache. You know, effectively, your entire OS should reside there. Your web browser, anything other than a movie, your music, your games, stuff like that, that all needs to be in cache. And I think, you know, for a modern OS with a couple of applications, I think that ends up being like 64 gigs. The, the, um, uh, the recommended install size for Windows 7 64-bit is just over 32. Yeah, exactly, so. right? Like, it's... it's uh, and I feel like, you know, the one Seagate, of the things... The Seagate drive, that doesn't have a write cache, right? That's only read, read cache, right? So they were supposed so it, to... So it watches the LBAs that you're reading from a lot, and then those get cached? Yeah, so they were supposed to enable a write cache on that drive. They actually, Seagate physically brought me a drive that had write caching enabled, but they were like, you can't, uh. you can't publish numbers on this. Um, <laughs> but they promised that at the beginning of this year that we would see a firmware update. Um, to enable that, but I, I don't know if that ever happened. See, and the, the promise always was, too, that it would park the drive while you weren't actively transacting things that weren't in cache. Yes. And then you would get a battery life savings that would be substantial. Correct. But I, I feel like I never really saw that, at least in the box that I run it on. You know, I run it in my notebook. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it, it's one of those things where there's just, like I said, there's just not enough cash on it. Um, I feel like Go back to 2008, and that design makes a lot of sense because, you know, it was, what, 80 gigs for 600 bucks. But, yeah. you know, we're at or below a dollar gigabyte with a lot of SSDs. Um, and I, I just, I don't, I don't know that I see a purpose for it anymore. I installed one in a friend of a friend's machine, and the only reason I couldn't get this guy to, to take an SSD was because he wanted one drive letter. Right. And he was really? like, yeah, I mean, that was it. It was just, he was like, I need one. I don't want two drive well, letters. I just and want And that's one. the advantage of the SSD caching situation too, is that you get one drive letter. Yes. Um, if you take the Asus P8 Z77 V premium um, support of a review that I've got coming up, that comes with the 32 gigabyte Lyson MSATA SSD for the purpose of users wanting it for SSD caching. That's... See, that's their add-on for the product. I and I've seen that. Like I just built an HTPC where I've got this MSATA. Um, I, I want to say it's it's actually the original Intel three ten or three twenty that they released on MSATA, um, or, or maybe something even older than that. But either way, I use that because it's an HTPC. I don't need tons of local storage, and it cuts down on clutter inside the mini ITX chassis. But I feel like for for a gaming box, I would almost understand the usefulness of something like that right i would just dedicate that i'd still have a dedicated uh ssd as my boot and os and application drive but i would mm. have a little 32 gig ssd cache just for my my steam directory or just for my my games drive that's uh, well, sort of what i do although I, I just got lazy and put steam on the solid state disk <laughs> yeah i mean know. that's ideal obviously right well, my steam's still on a mechanical so <laughs> Yeah. Well, then on the, on the Z68 box, I just, you know, it's one drive letter. And you can, you can really tell when it starts caching, you know, games that you actively play or even maps. Because the load times decrease. You know, like even CSGO, when I first put it on there, it was really slow. And yeah. now, now it loads much faster. I, I remember going from a mechanical to one of the 10,000 uh, RPM Western Digital Raptors Battlefield 2. Half the loading times. It was amazing. I think that's the best upgrade I can recommend for um, the best a normal user. You've ever spent. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was two hundred pounds, which is what three hundred sixty US, three fifty US for a hundred sixty gig hard, <laughs> mechanical hard drive. Years ago, though. 
Yeah. I So I remember those 10,000 RPM drives were... They were great improvements for a while, but then they st- they they were so slow to rev it that you could actually get better sequential I/O out of you know just a really high end new seventy two hundred RPM three and a half inch drive, and that that was one of the most frustrating things that you would have to make this kind of trade off between great low latency I/O and and you know just something that's just newer, and as a result, you had much better sequential I/O. The best thing I had about that drive though was it failed after four years, and Western Digital had a five year warranty and replaced it. No problems, That's awesome. no questions. And they <laughs> give you awesome. a, did they give you a bigger, better drive, which seems to be their MO? It, 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 it was a like for like. I've see, I've heard people oh, okay. get better ones, um, but uh, when it when it crashed, I had SSDs, so it's now sitting on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> see, I have this weird thing where whenever I RMA a Western Digital drive, I get back something bigger or better. And I guess it's a function of what they have on their shelf. At the time, but it, it, it's happened 100% of the time for me. So oh, what were the past two that you've gotten back that were, like, what did you send in and what did you get back? So one of them one of them was a notebook, and it was like a WD Blue, and I got back a larger WD Blue. Like, we went from, like, 500 gigs to a terabyte. <laughs> That's and awesome. then the other one was just a, a WD Green, you know, that I used in my RAID 5. Yeah. And it went from, like, 750 gigs to just two terabytes. So do they, like, is there a note in the box that you get, or it's just... No, no, it's just, like, the drive that you get back is mysteriously bigger. And I never know what to think about that, because it's like, am I being sort of, like, you know, very low-level bribed here? You know, like, the drive (laughs) went bad, so we're going to appease you by sending a bigger one? I mean, that's the right thing to do from a customer service standpoint, right? Yeah. You know, it's always just kind of, like... You know, it's not really stated. It's it's sort of on the, you know, on the down low. We're just going to give you this bigger drive. Right? Like, I know. So I've never, admittedly, I've never had that happen to me. My, my drives always come back identical or they go bad out of warranty. Oh, it's been like four. There have been like four, but those are the two that I remember what happened. And, and not oh, and the other one was, I, sorry, sorry, Ian, but the other one was, um, you know, one of those external uh, pro ones, you know, the silver external WD pro that has like, it had uh, FireWire 800 and eSATA. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was like that. 500 gigs, and at the time that was like really expensive. Uh, but it it finally died on me, and I sent it in, and I got back one that was like a terabyte. And you must have like just really good luck, or or whatever you know WD repair or RMA center you sent yeah, it into. Yeah, I'm, t- I'm telling awesome. you, it's 100 percent of the time. <laughs> That's great. Well, there's some advice then. If you buy WD, there's a there's a chance you'll get a better drive back from their RMA. <laughs> totally. no, not 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 to go completely off topic, um, but with Apple, I had a first gen Nano, uh, four gig one. After about four and a half five years, I got a message saying, "Warning, your battery may be defunct. Um, please send it, and we'll replace it like for like." I got back a fifth gen Nano, double the size, you know, touchscreen, the works. That's still in the box on my desk as well. That's awesome. See, I feel like Apple has historically done a very, very good job of, um, I mean, because you know you're you're basically paying for for two of whatever you're buying, right? The margins are so high that that you know you're effectively buying two whenever you go in to buy one. Um, but I feel like that they they do actually take care of you, right? If something goes wrong, or at least they used to. Um, in, well, they in, still have that. Everybody gets their one, or it's sort of like it's a little bit depreciated, but everybody still gets their one. They're you know, one, their one like, free replacement. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I encountered that firsthand, right? I had a, an 11 inch MacBook Air that, and I never drop any of my notebooks, but I managed to. I was just really tired after a trip one night, and I dropped it on like tile, and nothing happened to it uh, in terms of like you know the 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 actual components inside were were fine, but it looked like I just had butterfingers and and dropped a notebook. Um, so I brought it in just out of curiosity. I was like, hey, how much is it going to cost to fix this? And I had the lady was like, oh, it's going to be, I don't know, 750 bucks. And I was like, oh, that sucks. That's a lot of money. That's and like a then, whole new one. <laughs> I know, exactly. And then she was like, well, you know, just this once, we'll just give you another one for free. Um, and, and that's See, the same. See, that's totally that everybody gets their one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's weird because I've had people go in and try to do that and then just get completely rejected. Um, but then I, I've heard several kind of experiences that that are the same thing where it's just you walk in yeah you get your one free one and then you you leave oh, i think oh, it's oh. very much the personality right yeah or, or, or if you cry and say you can't afford it yes that's Maybe true they take I, pity on you i've heard that 
<laughs> I, I didn't cry, but I do think that there's a gender thing, right? Like if it's a... That's what um, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> my, my genius was a female, and, and that tended to work. And, and whenever it's been one of my friends who's a female and their genius is a male, that, that seems to work as well. Um, yeah, but there's anyways, definitely, uh, uh, there is definitely a correlation there. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that's not on an, on an official Apple, Apple memo that you could get hold of. Yes, no, I'm, I'm certain. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, in, in the Anontech spirit, we don't actually have data to back this up. That's, that's well run and well vetted. <laughs> um, so we got kind of off topic, but I wanted to, before we, we go on to the next thing, I, I wanted to get, Ian, your, your recommendations. If I'm, you know, I'm, I'm building an Ivy Bridge system today, what do I buy? What board do I buy? And, wh and what CPU do I buy? Um, in my experience with the boards that I've tested, um, I'm really liking... Uh, the Gigabyte Z77X UD5H, which I mentioned before, just because mm -hmm. you get a lot of kit out of your money. Um, it also features multi-core enhancement, which is a new feature that's running on some Z77 boards um, to increase the multiplier during heavy loading. Um, pair that so, with... So that's just basically, um, you, you know, currently today, if you have one core active, you get one turbo ratio. If you have another core active, you get a separate one. If you have four cores active, you get a lower speed. Uh, Multi-core enhancement just runs all configurations at the same turbo frequency, regardless of how many cores you have active? Yes, the, the maximum turbo frequency that Intel specs for that processor. Okay. Um, so it, it's just, you know, in the box, easy overclocking. You don't have to do anything. It's just stuff's faster. Yeah, and, and if you want to overclock, um, say most boards will happily do 4.4 gigahertz on the uh, top end K processor, IV processor. Um, I totally recommend the K processors just because the boards. Well, well hang on for a second. Just back to the motherboard. So you recommend Sorry. this this gigabyte um, at the ATX form factor. Well, what if I'm I'm shopping Mini ITX? Um, in terms of Mini ITX, you've got three options on the market. Um, there's the ASUS P877i Deluxe. There's the ASRock Z77e ITX and the Zotac Z77 ITX. I have two of those boards in. I'll be getting a third. There will be a review it shortly hopefully um but the uh okay. the, the the asus board um looks pretty cool it, it's a bit funky the vrm is on a daughter board at 90 degrees um so it means that they can fit more onto the actual real estate of the board oh, that's really interesting um i'm I, i'm planning to pair one of them up with um the bit phoenix prodigy for my new work pc which i'm building shortly nice Okay, cool. Um, All right, so then on the, the CPU side, what, what do you recommend there processor-wise? Um, it, for me, as, as a power user, I obviously like speed, so the K processors are what I will look into, especially when they're uh, only a little bit more expensive than the standard processor. Um, I know you've got a cup, pair of T processors in, um, which sound quite interesting. Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually working on... Um, so, so for those of you who aren't familiar, you know, you have the normal, you know, Core i7, uh, let's say 3550 or Core i5 3550. Um, and then, you know, Intel with its new nomenclature has uh, a suffix letter. So K gives you a fully unlocked part. Um, that's a part that you can just dial in whatever multiplier up to 57x and, and easily overclock it. Uh, they have the S SKUs, which uh, the standard Ivy Bridges are, what, 77 watt TDPs? Um that sounds Offic right, yeah. Uh, officially, yes. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and the, uh, well, yeah, because a lot of them are still marked as 95 watts to avoid confusion or whatever. Um, but, uh, so you can get the S-series SKU, which is, I think, a 65-watt TDP, um, and, and they attain that both through a combination of, of just binning uh, lower leakage parts as well as lowering the, the base clock speed on, on some of the parts. You don't actually give up a ton of performance, but you know, if you want to keep temperatures down a bit, uh, there's that option. And then now you know, with Ivy Bridge, we have the T-series SKUs, uh, which are 45-watt quad-core um, desktop parts today. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at both S and T-series right now, and I think in the next week or so, you'll see a, a review up from that. Um, so I always for you, wish there was like an S and a K, you know, like I want the better bin, but I also want unlocked. That's true. I, presumably the K's, well, it used to be that the very, very high end stuff were the best bin regardless, right? Yeah. Um, the, um, the, the, the K processors from what I know from what I do overclocking wise, um, they can vary quite a lot. Um, so some of them will happily do five gigahertz at 1.2 volts, which is ridiculous. Um, 
my processor, for example, will just about do 5 gigahertz at 1.4 volts, but this all produces so much heat. So you really are, it's 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 luck of the draw when it comes to overclocking with Iowa Bridge. Hmm, do you still have is that on air then, or do you put it on water? Um, personally, I use um, one of these all-in-one liquid cooler systems, which is essentially the same as a medium to high-end air cooler. Um, but uh, uh, Ivory Bridge deals with heat a lot differently to what people are used to. So, uh, with the liquid coolers, you don't feel them get hot, but on the um, in the operating system, you see them get hot if you look at temperature sensors. And a lot so, of I that... think you're running an H100, right? The Corsair H100? Um, I, I have various, but yeah, this applies to the Corsair H100 as well. And yeah, when, sort of when you talk about, um, you know, Ivy Ridge, you can see it getting hot. That's, you're talking about the thermal interface material discussion that, that everyone's been having. Right, so there's a discussion whether um, how the processor is connected to the integrated heatsink um, and how Intel have been flip-flopping between um, thermal interface material and soldering it on. And it seems that the uh, thermal interface material is not exactly the most premium on Ivory Bridge processors. Um, there are reports online that if you... We don't suggest you do this, but if you take off the... Uh, the heat spreader and replace the thermal interface material you can reduce temperatures up to 20 degrees yeah there was actually a great thread in our own forums um where where one of our folks went in and, and did that and posted just tremendous improvements in thermals i saw um, those that 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 thread was amazing <laughs> so what do you use to actually with... remove the the heat spreader then can you just use acetone or or what uh, it's it it's i don't know how it's, it's bonded it, it's thermally blond bonded with um, a type of glue, so razors, heat guns, and hammers. <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. It's a pain. I remember I delitted a, I want to say like an old Athlon X2 or something, and that was a pain. See, this is what I'm saying. I want like I want a tier, you know, maybe make it like a 3780 KS that has no integrated heat spreader, all sorts of warnings on the box, <laughs> but you know it's like the best bin ever. Well, and boom, you, you know, like, I know what I'm doing. Well, you could consider this as a strategy move by Intel such that they could release a part later on with an improved thermal interface material, which reduces temperatures, and then everybody goes and buys that. So it adds in a stopgap between now and Haswell if they don't necessarily want to say performance increases, just temperature improvements. So um, I am... Almost 100% sure Haswell will use uh, the the older uh, solder interface between uh, heat spreader and, and the chip itself. That would be awesome. Um, I can't say more, but I'm, <laughs> I'm fairly certain that that <laughs> is the case. You're very sure. <laughs> I'm fairly certain that that's the case. Um, I think if you look at everything about Ivy Bridge, right, it was clear that this is a part, one, that's designed for mobile, Two, it's a part that is designed to make Intel a ton of money, right? It's a very, very small die. They didn't have any competitive pressure from AMD to, to kind of balloon things up. Uh, so it's, you know, and, and 22 nanometer yields, if they're doing well, uh, means Intel can get a ton of these per wafer, uh, get good margin on all of them. Um, and if you look at all of the areas where you can save money, uh, not using whatever, a couple of grams of metal uh, times whatever, 200, 300 million units, however many they're going to end up shipping, uh, it, it just all goes into the bank. Well, well, Has well, anybody that's... done any, any compositional analysis on that solder? Is it just normal solder? It, it must not be. It must be something weird. Lead free. Uh, yeah. Because I know at the place I used to work, you know, um, we would just use indium. You know, just toss on like a little slab of indium. Boom. You know. Don't forget, Intel doesn't have to sell Ivor Bridge to Sandy Bridge users. They're selling it to people who are in that three-year, four-year, five-year upgrade cycle. Yeah, no, that's very true, and I think that's you know that's one thing that I you know I feel like I didn't do a good job of uh, comparing just Ivy to you know let's say Conroe and all that other uh, all of the older generation stuff because honestly that's the upgrade that people are looking at. Um, but users it, can get that in bench, though, right? I mean, yes. you can go and look. Yes, yeah, no, you can you can compare everything back to. Uh, I want to say I even have some old Pentium fours in there. 
Like the highest clocked Pentium 4 ever, like 3.8 gigahertz or something? Yeah, either 3.8 or maybe something was wrong with that chip or I couldn't find it, or maybe 3.6 <laughs> or 3.73 is the highest <laughs> I went. Um, the hun- but, big 130 watt. Exactly. Beasts. Uh, those were terrible. I have um, that somewhere here, li- literally in this room. Is, is, is it keeping you warm? I use it in the winter time. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, I just fire up, you know, like... For, for Mark, that keeps me warm. Actually, Ryan was telling me like he had actually measured, and he was like, "Yeah, I don't, I don't need heating anymore. I just fire up, you know, for Mark or just like crunch some bitcoins." That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, the As, GPUs get they they get amazingly hot these days. I mean, granted, we're talking about multiple billions of transistors now. <laughs> it's it's um, currently with my testing because I've got three, four GPUs on the go and they're all really sandwiched together even though it's on an open test bed I still spool up the fans to 100% just to get the heat away you know you've got four GPUs each producing you know 150, 200 watts it gets pretty toasty that's insane that's, well, I, was I, telling, I was telling Anon last week I was doing some, some hash computation on two 470s and yeah. I actually exceeded my UPS and thought I had blown like the circuit for my office because everything turned off, but apparently that UPS was just creating problems. Um, I, I remember doing some CUDA computation um, while I was working uh, on a 480, and because the fan was so loud, it just annoyed everybody else in the office, especially when I had sort of a simulation <laughs> that ran for two or three days at 100%. It was just going... Rrr! Did they make you go outside? They were like, you need to put that box outside, sir. <laughs> no, I told them to put headphones on. That worked. <laughs> the worst is um, when I was, I, I got, we recently moved the site to our, our final resting place in terms of hardware, um, Sandy Ridge Zeon based stuff. Or actually, no, it's on Sandy Ridge Zeon. It's Westmere based Zeons. Um, and in, in the process, I, I wanted to benchmark our old hardware. So I, I grabbed our old database server, which was like this four or five U eight core Optron box. And when I say eight cores, I mean, it had four dual core processor cards in it because you couldn't <laughs> get an eight core CPU back then. Um, and that thing was super loud. I think at idle, it pulled almost 500 Watts. Wow. Uh, just cause it was that, that kind of tail end of people not caring and people caring about power consumption. I've this um, for my competitive overclocking that I do in my spare time. I've got some of these high-powered Delta fans that put out 300 cubic feet a minute of air, and they're sort of like 72 decibels each. Oh, so oh man! That's so so you're you wearing like ear protection in the same room with it, like. So, so sorry. What did you say? I can't hear you. <laughs> so then you you end up wearing. <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah. Um, okay, all right. So I, I don't know that we actually answered the question. Which which models would you recommend? Kind of good, better, best in terms of Ivy Bridge. What you know, if you're going to build an Ivy Bridge system today, what what chip are you are you recommending? Um, because there are so many chips for all the different price points. Um, budget everything else to do with your system, particularly the main important points that you may be looking for, such as the GPU, motherboard, the case. You know, something that looks nice. And then pick the best CPU for the rest of your budget. Budget, preferably a K CPU if you want to get a bit of more performance. Do you have a preference, um, i5 or i7? Um, i5 is uh, more price competitive, um, but i7 gets you the best performance at the end of the day. So do whatever you can. If you if you can do it, an i7 is worth it. Otherwise, go i5. Yes. Okay, that works. Uh, um, for for friends and colleagues that are building gaming systems, especially on tight budgets. Um, you know, getting a dual core with hyper-threading uh, usually satisfies them, especially for gaming. Yeah, that's true. That's true, because you end up being mostly GPU-bound anyways. Yes. Um, yeah, at the same time, I see Battlefield 3 eat up almost all 12 threads for me when I'm when I'm playing. You know, like, I just have a second monitor with the, you know, some monitors open... Um, but, but, but Battlefield 3 for me is um, a little bit odd. Um, I think that Battlefield 3 forces a lot of extra processing, which isn't needed. But Yeah, it's probably there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just like seeing all those threads get eaten up. No, uh, it's uh, true. I mean, like, it's. I, I had a friend who just built an Ivy Bridge system, and he was torn between i5 and i7. 
and the reason he went to i7 is he didn't want to see the number of uh, active CPU threads go down from eight to four. Because um, obviously you lose hyper-threading, right? So you, you, get, you only get four little uh, processor windows or processor uh, thread monitors and windows. Yeah, and for me, that's the thing with the 2500K. You know, like if I was to upgrade that box, I would go all the way to 3770K just because I want to see. You know, I want those eight threads. That's true. And I uh, guess like high-end desktop CPUs have come down. I mean, these things used to be 1000 or 1200 bucks. Um, I remember I bought a Pentium 2 right when I started the site. And I paid $1,162 for it, a Pentium 2 266. When you were 14? Yes. Well, it wasn't my dad paid the money for it. <laughs> <laughs> or no, actually, no, it might have been me. I, that might have been like two or three months worth of an OnTech advertising budget went into that. That's but you reviewed important. it too, right? Yes, yes. I needed a Pentium 2. I mean, Intel didn't send us stuff until the Pentium 3. Wow. Darn. I still have a Pentium Pro 200 somewhere. I have I have one of those. It's a good chip. Yeah, and, and there's those BIOS, the headers on the motherboard, the stock Intel one. You can like push it to like 233. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure my father has an old machine with a turbo button on the front. Uh, I remember oh, yeah. those. <laughs> you know, there was actually, most people don't know this, the um, the Pentium 2, the original design for it was a socket. It wasn't, you know, the, the slot, slot one or whatever is what it ended up being. Uh, but a friend of mine actually has one of the socketed Pentium 2s. And it was just gigantic. They were worried that, I guess, you know, you just break all the pins trying to install it. Oh, is, is these uh, provided pins? on daughter boards? Yeah, no. the final Pentium 2 ended up being just a, like, it was like the first Athlon, right? It was just a card that you stuck in. Yeah. Well, I mean, the big concern is always insertion force, right? So I wonder how many pins or what the insertion resistance was. I don't know. I heard it was like just ungamely. It was just, ugh. It was a pain. <laughs> okay. That's all right, like so back in the days when like men were men and like everybody was men, you know, like uh, you just had to like muscle your cards in. That's Bri true. You know? Brian, Brian, if you ever have a chance to play with Sandy Bridgie and put one of those processors in because it's got a dual clip insertion system, it feels like you're going to break something when you put it in. See, I I'm can't sure. tell you how many times I've hovered over buying an SMB E system because. That seems like the logical upgrade path from Golf Town, right? But at, at the same time, I'm I'm just like, I'll just keep waiting. You See, know? I, I, yeah, I, I think Intel has done a, a, a bad thing, right? Because if you if you go the Sandy Bridge E route, right? If you stick on the the ultra high end, you know, tons of memory bandwidth platform, you're last to get all of the new architectures now. Exactly. Yeah, right? I like, just can't swallow that. No, it's it it doesn't I, I it does nothing to promote that that platform. I but get it, that on. It, 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 Sorry, would, it would help if they uh, provided an unlocked quad core to the system, like the um, the nine twenty was with Nehalem. Yeah. The thirty eight twenty just doesn't do that. But it's still again, if you if you went Sandy Ridge E, you still don't have Ivy Ridge today. You don't have twenty two nanometer, and when you get that, the rest of the world, you know, just a couple months later, is going to have Haswell, um, and you're just always like this six to nine months behind. Isn't the 3820 a completely different design, too? Like, they went out of their way to make a four-core Sandy Bridge Extreme? Like, it's, it's, not, it's not like a, a 3960X or 3930K with two disabled? No, well, they're all, I mean, because it's, it's, they're all Xeon parts, right? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's its own die just for, I mean, because obviously those are really big die. <laughs> So I yeah. don't know. That 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 kind of sours me on the whole platform, right? If you're going to charge a premium, I want I want access to the the absolute latest and greatest architecture. I don't want to be, you know, half a year to three quarters or even a full year behind everyone else. Um, yeah, me either. Okay, switching gears a bit. Brian, you are the senior smartphone editor. What, That's right. <laughs> <laughs> what are you working on? What what's if oh someone same same question? If someone is going to buy a phone today. Um, you mean, where, where's the Galaxy S3 International review? That's, <laughs> that's the most commonly asked question ever. In fact, it doesn't even matter what, what article you're reading, you'll see that. Yeah, that's true. And, and part of that's my fault. I need to chime in also with kind of an SOC analysis there. Yeah, I mean, well, we're, I mean, we're actively working on that, I guess, is the answer. And it's true. But, but based on, so there are a lot of reviews that you have in the pipeline right now. You have that's the International right. Galaxy S3. You've got... Um, well, what else do you have? So I have, I have the International Galaxy S3, 
Uh, we have LTE testing uh, to be completed on the uh, AT&T Galaxy S3. Uh, and that's finished on the Verizon one, and it's partially finished on the AT&T one. All that I'm waiting for is just the, the tethering test. Uh, and then we also have the Huawei Ascend uh, P1, which is Huawei Ascend D P, uh, P1. Uh, and that's the OMAP 4460-based Huawei phone, which is sort of like their first high-end one. But comes before the D quad, which is their their own you know quad core SoC, and yes. hopefully we get that one because that's really interesting. Uh, and then there's also the Pure Pure Vision 808, uh, which is of course the uh, 41 megapixel Nokia phone that I'm holding in my hands now. And then um, what else is there? I guess there's still the Orange San Diego, which is the same as the uh, the um, Zolo Lava Zolo X800. The Medfield, you know phone. the Medfield phone, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so, so based on what you have right now, if if I'm in the market for an AT and T based um, or, or an Android phone on AT and T, what, what's your what's your recommendation? It's definitely either the One X or the Galaxy S three, and and though I say the One X uh, because it's now ninety nine dollars, which is just kind of it's kind of crazy for a high end, you know, absolute latest and greatest. That's true. And it's the same SoC as the uh, as Galaxy S3 on AT&T, of course. You know, they're both 8960. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, yeah, $99. And I, I think the camera is better. I know this is sort of a point of contention among, you know, the Galaxy S3, One X, or I guess HTC One, uh, and iPhone 4 camera. You know, like what order you would put them in. Yeah. And it's sort of like everybody has their own take on where Galaxy S3 and One, the HTC One camera, sit on that spectrum. Uh, and I, I still think the One camera is better, just because the low light performance is so much superior. Because that low, low f number, you know, f 2.0 versus f 2.6. Uh, and you know, what's really annoying is that when I when I published those, when I published the Galaxy S3 review, I had taken some pictures in the light box, like controlled low light. And the difference was substantial, but when, when I finally put it all together, there's always things that I forget. And that was one of the things that I forgot to put in. It was just a rollover with, here's the difference, right? Oh, you, know, you should so, totally do like a pipeline post just with that. Um, yeah, no, and I have them. I have like iPhone 4S, Galaxy S3, and um, the HTC One X International. And um, of course, you know, the difference there is sort of a function of what ISP is used and all these other factors, but it was a very controlled test with, you know, sort of like dusk lighting and I finally got a light meter and yeah, to me, that was, that was the decider between them. You know, like when I, when I do shopping, it's now just what SOC is inside and then maybe what software, uh, and then next on the chain is what, what baseband and then price point. Right. Okay. So, so, so Price point and and the camera tilt it in favor of the One X on AT and T. Um, what what would tilt you in the other direction towards the Galaxy S three? Mm, definitely display. Yeah, obviously you know like Samsung. That's the thing too, right? You know like HTC here is starting to get to the point where they don't really have control over much of the whole chain. Yeah. Right. Whereas Samsung is they're making their own SoC, they're making their own display, they're making their own baseband in some cases, right? So they. They're they're able to you know there is there's always that talk of who can integrate these parts better, right? And and ultimately, yeah, I believe that Samsung does have a little bit of a com, you know a competitive case there to be made. So, what um, is it about the Galaxy S three display that you you prefer to the One X display? It's slightly larger, I believe, uh, and it just you know obviously that Super AMOLED, it, you know, like there is a there is a case to be made for the fact that the contrast is essentially infinite you know there's always that sort of like the fact that it's not always off but it is off yeah you know there's like this weird dc bias that's lingering around so it's not off uh, in a totally dark room but i think the contrast is phenomenal and um just subjectively the battery life is better like they're running a bigger battery you know so that that's the other thing i will say that the one the one series that are 8960 based uh have faster wi-fi Right, so they, they have some like weird handover and hand hand off issues that are still getting, you know, smoothed over. Yeah. But when it does work, it's like substantially faster. Like, you know, the fire rate is like 150 megabits compared to 72. Oh wow. 
Yeah, and if you look at our numbers, it's 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 like 130 megabits versus 40 in in real testing. Wow, that is a so, huge difference. Yeah, so um, I mean those those things you like add up slowly. I, I guess I left out the Galaxy Nexus though, which is unfortunate because that's that's the device that I find myself using the most now. But that's because of, it has Jelly Bean. Yeah, that's right. And it's 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 really it's dramatic how much of a difference just having 4.1 makes that phone feel. Yeah. That's true. Like it's a completely new phone. Like the the phone that launched, you know, last calendar year is just nowhere near as performant as the the phone that the Galaxy Nexus with 4.1 is. You know, they're just completely completely different. Well, would you recommend? I mean, it's fairly dated hardware and and definitely not as competitive of a display. Is there a situation in which you'd recommend that over the Galaxy S3 or or um yeah, I, th- I still think it's worth it to have an unlocked device, you know, and, and of course it has Pentaband um, so that it'll work on AT&T and T-Mobile and everywhere else in the world uh, that runs WCDMA. So, you know, I think there's still a big case to be made for spending the extra money, getting it non-commit, you know, no, I mean, it's 350 bucks and you get a phone that's going to be updated at least one more time, Right. It's not it's not locked to any carrier. There's no bloat. Um, you know, as long as you're willing to deal with the fact that, yeah, there's really no support infrastructure, <laughs> you know? So this is sort of like an enthusiast thing. I, I think that's, you know, primarily our audience is enthusiasts, right? Um, so, yeah, that's the other big recommendation is that, that that device for 350 is still, you know, top top three on my list. So if you are not interested in renewing your contract uh on at&t go galaxy nexus get it off contract um, yeah or even t-mobile if you're doing t-mobile prepaid you know like the magical 30 dollar plan like i yes. see a lot of people doing that discussion you know you know with at&t prepaid like simple talk or you know there are a couple other mvnos or i still think the best is to do t-mobile prepaid 30 dollar that walmart plan it's not mm-hmm. even really a walmart plan it's more of an online plan you just you just go and buy a SIM activation kit, activate it on the website, and boom, you get $30 unlimited text, unlimited data, 100 minutes of call. You know, people that do a lot of calls, it's not going to work unless you do VoIP or something, Google yeah. Voice. But uh, people like me that are all data and all SMS, that's just unbeatable, right? Um, so, yeah, that's that's the best. I mean, and then with that, obviously, you just take your the cost savings over the course of a year and spend that on a device totally unlocked. That's that's what I that's my biggest thing, at least right now. No, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I would love for the the kind of uh, subsidized carrier model in the U.S. to to go away. Well, yeah, and the carriers sort of view the the prepaid customers as some like a lesser you know cased. And even if if you are a prepaid you know customer in the U.S., you are sort of looked at as like a lower social class. And, uh, you know, even there was a New York Times story about that, too, that, you know, like, it's sort of like a a socially bad thing. Uh, And I think that's going to go away just because, again, it's it's cheaper. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, You know, what what's 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 the deal? Right. There is no rhetorical question. There is no deal, you know, which is the point. Right. You're not under a contract. You know, like if something is terrible, you can just say no. Yeah. So and and it works with DCHSPA plus, too. So you can go and get you know, Galaxy S3 or 1S, or even the Galaxy S2 T-Mobile, pop the SIM in, and then boom, you get up to, you know, like, I, I've seen tests of above 25 megabits that's on awesome. uh, DCHSPA+. Yeah. Um, so so that's kind of your answer on AT&T. What about on, on Verizon? What, what's your current recommendation mm, there? I think I think on Verizon, it's it's also Galaxy S3. Um, I mean, they have, they have some phone that's coming that's basically their 1X. You know, I don't know if you saw those leaks. I think some of those uh, they are the APQ8064 base devices with uh, MDM9615 baseband. So quad-core crate with LTE. I think that's on the horizon for Verizon. Uh, I think they were holding out for that because the uh, obviously the, in- the incredible 4G LTE was not so incredible, right? <laughs> like, I, think our, I think our headline was that this is the 1S that wasn't a 1S. Right, so I, I think you know, like right now, Galaxy S3 is still the best prospect on Verizon, unless you can get, you know, like see their Galaxy Nexus. It's impossible to recommend because the updates have been super slow, 
you know, there's always been lingering concerns about the quality of the CDMA 1X connectivity on there. Yeah. You know, it's never really gone away. Like, I, I still maintain that it isn't really a problem. You know, like, I still have one kicking around that the SIM hasn't been turned off yet. And, you know, it, it works, but I, I'm just not an active 1X person. You know, I don't use CDMA 1X anymore. Yeah. So, and I feel like everybody's expectations were set based on a different platform. So that's why you see the discrepancy, and that's why people say that there is an issue, even though there isn't. You know, at least for me, that's what I that's what I suspect on Verizon. Yeah, admittedly, I, I didn't have much time with the the Verizon Galaxy Nexus, but um, I, I think your post on it uh, kind of cleared up a lot of stuff, just in in how signal strength was being reported and and the differences there. Yeah, and there's those differences between RSSI and RSRP. Um, I mean, RSCP for Verizon. Uh, and, you know, like now they've standard on R standardized on RSSI and actually pushed out updates to all the phones so that now you, you only see RSSI instead of RSCP. Um, so that, that problem has sort of gone away. Uh, it's funny to me that, that that's, you know, a, kind of ever since the iPhone 4, just reporting signal strength has been such a big deal. Right. It's something that, that folks have, hey, you know, it's cropped up twice now with one with the, the original iPhone 4 and, and obviously in, in this update here. Um, definitely. It, definitely. I mean, it's a valid concern, right? Like you're buying a phone so that it can be mobile. So obviously whether or not that works is, a, you know, like at least 50 percent of the device. Right. And the other 50 percent is maybe, you know, combination of offline use, performance, display, you know, all those sort of things. Yeah. You know, because otherwise it's not really a phone. It's just, it's like an iPod touch, <laughs> you know, like, like who wants that? Like well, people do want that, but right, you know, not a phone. So, so we touched on, um, we, we touched on recommendations, uh, Android recommendations for, for, uh, Verizon and for AT&T. Um, obviously if you're an iPhone customer, I'm guessing your, your recommendation is to wait a yeah, month or two. Definitely wait. And, and yeah. what are you expecting out of that? What am I expecting out of iPhone next or yeah. the new iPhone or iPhone 5 or whatever we decide to, to name it? I just call it iPhone next. I mean, I think, I think obviously you've seen that Apple can't really keep, rumor, keep uh, secrets anymore. You know, like just a function of volume. Yes. You know, like I, I tweeted uh, and, and you, you thought the same thing, that you can sort of have volume, cost, or secrecy, like pick two. You know, you can't have all three, so... Uh, you know, I would say it's fairly credible that you're going to have a four inch display, you know, that's taller, same width. Um, obviously you need to have LTE right now to even have a competitive handset Yes. at the high end. So obviously that, I mean, that has to be there. Uh, and the other, the only real other question is then what SOC. And I, I think we've speculated pretty publicly, even though we don't play in the rumor space, that it will be some 32 nanometer Samsung manufactured, just 32 nanometer high K middle gate, probably dual core A9s, just higher clocks. So essentially the A5R2, like what you see shipping in iPad 2, 4, and the Apple TV 3. Um, so I mean, obviously it makes logical sense for Apple to slowly scale their volume there. And we're, we're better to do it than the cost reduced iPad and the hobby you know, Apple TV product. And then as for LTE, you know, the only obvious choice is MDM 9615. Uh, you know, so I think, I think that it's all fairly, you know, played out, you know, even though, you know, there, there are these questions about what are the sort of things on the edges that are going to be differentiated, right? Like front facing camera, uh, and rear facing camera. Although I think again, rear facing camera, it's obvious that they're going to have different optics, wider chief ray angle, so that the thing is thinner, but same 8 megapixel sensor. Um, so similar optical performance, wider chief ray angle, so that you can make the package thinner. And then, I mean, the rest of it is, is all fairly obvious, right? Like, you need to have dual band Wi-Fi. So BCM 4334, just like what we see in Galaxy S3. So, I mean, so, I guess that sort of takes some of the, like, excitement out of it, right? But, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't really matter the, at this the point, The part right? that I'm confused on, or not that I'm confused on, I, I'm, I'm just, 
Are, are you are you expecting? I, I think the dual core Cortex A9 thing makes a lot of sense, and then you go in with dual core A15s for you know, let's say the fourth gen iPad. Uh, yeah, absolutely. In, at the end of Q1 next year, um, but but what do you do on the GPU side? Do just you increase use the, the die savings to to double the core count, or do you just increase clock speeds? I think they can just get away with increasing clocks. I mean, um, at least are we talking A5 R2? Yeah, I mean, whatever they end up calling it, right? If, if yeah. you think it's, you think it'll literally be the same chip, just at higher frequencies. Yeah, twenty percent higher clocks. I mean, yeah, I don't see why not. Honestly, I mean, the display isn't that much bigger, right? You can easily get, you know, sort of parity with the number of pixels, just by increasing your clocks. I think. I don't think they need to. You know, I think the big thing now is margins, and sort of keeping that where it should be, and obviously having a bigger die is sort of the opposite direction that's true so so and you know and taking all of your your gains from moving to this different process node and just going to you know higher clocks that are you know conservatively higher like again 20 percent because i mean even right now it's only 800 megahertz capped on on the cpu for a5 and i forget where gpu is but i mean we've, we've talked about those numbers probably what was it like 250 300 yeah it's something like that i think it's sub 300 yeah so i mean obviously you can go way higher and i don't see anything wrong with doing that you know and again because the battery is again that leaked part about the same capacity you know like it's like four percent bigger um again higher voltage chemistry just like we've seen in other phones um yeah it's it's all you know, I hate to say fairly obvious, but if, if you look at the direction that everybody else has gone, you can make some pretty safe bets, you know, about what, what things are going to play out to be. I will say the one thing that interests me a lot is the fact that the back is machined aluminum or some sort of machined material. You know, at yeah. least the, the leaks that you've seen, you can see the machine marks, right? So just from purely looking at that, you can tell that the device doesn't have NFC, right? So... No, like there, I saw some discussion and people were like, does it have NFC? You know, is it going to have uh, some sort of payment thing that's NFC based? So obviously if you have a back that's basically entirely opaque, you know, it's, it's not. So <laughs> again, these little, these little things you can sort of, yeah, you know, I hate, I hate to guess on, but you know, like that's, it's sort of fun to, to guess about. Yeah, no, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, wh what do you think that 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 uh, that metal back does, if anything, for antenna performance, or or do you just keep it isolated and, and it's a non-issue? Yeah, well, the top the top and bottom look like they're glass, so um, fair, it can be fairly isotropic even with just having the top and bottom glass. Like those are the those are probably going to be the main you know regions that we. So basically, like like the 4S design, the top and bottom use. It looks like they've inherited that into the the five or next or whatever you want to call it design yeah. and that there are, there are two little cutouts at top and bottom that are glass so yeah i mean you can have it be fairly isotropic and still you know have metal in the middle um as long as you've done the simulations and and again in, in lte you don't really want the whole thing to be isotropic you know it, it you know it's good to have some sort of uh it's good to have in, independent sets of antennas uh at least with lte so you can do your your memo uh, you know, without essentially getting the same data twice. Yeah, no, right? that, makes so, sense. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, well, listen, we are coming up here on just over 58 minutes. Um, I know we wanted to talk about SOCs, but I think we might save that for next time. Um, so the plan here for everyone listening is uh, to kind of make this a regular affair. Um, it won't always be PC focused. It won't always be mobile focused. It, it'll be, you know, whatever happens to be uh, on our minds or happening in the industry at the time. Um, so please comment, email us, let us know what you liked, what you didn't like, uh, and what you think about the format. Uh, and we'll, we'll keep this coming. We, we don't have another date set just yet, uh, but we'll try and figure out a, uh, a good and regular cadence and, and kind of commit to it. And the other thing would be to, to bring in, uh, some of the other folks, uh, Ryan Smith, our senior GPU editor, uh, Jared Walton, you know, all the other guys that you see on the site and, and kind of make this a regular affair. Uh, any closing remarks, Ian or, or Ryan? I want to hear Ian's thoughts on the Desire C. Honestly, maybe that's for next week. But I'd love to hear. I know. The, I know you. You gave that device to your wife to use, right? Yeah. So yeah. I'd it's, love to hear um, about that. As an SGS two user, you know, I find it a little slow, but it's perfect for what she needs.
That's good. I'm glad it's working out. I mean, like, I think there's this there's this perception that we only look at the high end in the SOC space, right? But I mean, that's just not true at all. Even though we don't, you know, we haven't exactly covered that part. I think that that part is really interesting. Well, I think um, that's going to change, right? You know, it, it's it's everything trickles down. We entered the smartphone space uh, when the high end was at the bare minimum level of what we considered to be acceptable in terms of, hey, we can actually go in, offer analysis, and do something a little different, um, offer value. Now what we're going to see, I think, going forward is that that high end of the SO space becomes the, the mid-range um, and then eventually trickles down to the low end, and we can offer that same sort of analysis top to bottom there. Yeah, I mean, at the, at the same time, there's a whole new, you know, that's ARM Cortex A5, uh, MSM 7225A in there, um, which is which is pr fairly interesting to see Qualcomm using just, you know, an A5 as opposed, as opposed to Scorpion or, you know, like some sort of really pared down crate. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I guess from their perspective, they don't have a, right, they're, they're still a, a one design house. And, and that high end, that high end part isn't, Still, it's not quite big enough where you can just kind of cut it up and and yeah. you know, derive something smaller from it. But I think that's definitely in the cards going forward. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a great place to stop. We'll we'll uh, discuss SOCs and and potential consolidation in that market next time, um, as well as uh, the rest of the things that we're working on in the background. Um, so I want to thank everyone for listening, and of course, thank you all for reading the site. And uh, we will be sure to do this again soon. See you next time. Bye.